is a member of numerous associations, has a diploma in medical hypnosis from the London College of Clinical Hypnosis, and has been trained in adjunctive hypnotherapy, which I want to learn about, and his book, The Science of Spirit Possession, the Science of Spirit Possession uh, has been acclaimed academically and publicly, so that's a... Thank you, Fabian, for that introduction, and thank you for inviting me to participate in this um, conference, in this panel, and I thank you for attending to listen to what I have to say. For me, I've, my, this brings me full circle, because 10 years ago, I was at Bangor studying, um, researching for my thesis, when Bettina was director of postgraduate research. So it's nice to come back to Lampeter and see her in the position that she's in as professor and director of the archive. And of course, while I was researching at Bangor, I used to have to come down here and access, because in those days you couldn't do it online, you had to get your hands on the keys. So I spent many happy days sitting in the library accessing the database. And of course now it's, it's done online. So that's my, uh, my background. Uh, but as, as Fabian said, I'm a, um, a, a psychologist. Uh, not an anthropologist, and my research is, is hands-on. I'm a practicing clinical psychologist, and on a daily basis I treat people who come to me for help because uh, either themselves or a family member feel that they may be being influenced by discarnate spirit entities. So I'm just going to introduce you to my method of data collection and um, how we arrive at the essential um, objective, as Fabian suggested, is in the dialogue. Um, dialogue between spirits and mediums and, and so on. So let me um, introduce you to the remote spirit release database. What I do is remote spirit release. I don't see clients or patients face to face. It's all done beyond time and space through mediumship. 50% of our clients are in uh, the continent of North America. Um, so my research objectives. I'm just going to refer to my notes. There's a difference between what is uh, a veridical that is originating from a verified ex external source, um, uh, that which originates in the subliminal, the unconscious, and what is created in the imagination. Putting it simply, is there a difference between an hallucination, which is imagined or, or self-created, or a voice that's coming from an external source? This is the primary question, okay? Is it important to know the difference? Well, in the treatment of psychosis, it certainly is. Because if a person is presenting to the medical profession with symptoms of auditory hallucinations, then they're being treated with uh, a mental illness and given antipsychotic drugs. But if that diagnosis is wrong, and the voices are actually coming from a discarnate entity, in other words, if that person's possessed, then the drugs are just going to make things a lot worse. That's the basic question. Can you tell the difference? I'm going to go through uh, a few essential points regarding the, the research objectives and the experimental hypotheses. First, is there a difference between an auditory hallucination and a voice from an external source? First question. How can you tell the difference between a dissociated subpersonality and a possessing spirit? This is one of the very first questions I asked when I was presented with cases that challenged traditional mainstream treatment methods. What is the influence of discarnate spirits on mental health? That's a big question. Can spiritual mediums be instrumental in the healing process? Which is what Emily was talking about earlier with her research into spiritist practices. 
Now, we're not using spiritist practices. We're using secular, non-religious language in accessing these patients remotely by telepathy, not face-to-face -face, and not in groups. So can we communicate with discarnate entities through mediums? Can we communicate with patients with telepathic methods? So if you've got a patient in North America, can we communicate with that person without having to go there and see them face to face? These are the research objectives and experimental hypotheses, but the primary question is, do these methods actually work? Or is this all just figments of my imagination? Last week, I accessed our own records, our own database, and came up with 375 cases that have been recorded by me in the last 18 months, people coming and asking for help. And um, online, I accessed the Alistair Hardy archive with key um, search criteria to determine how many cases out of the total archive of more than 6,000 reports, how many were, had uh, responded to the search criterion demon, possession, spirit possession, demonic possession. Can you see those results on the board without me reading them out? You'll see that devil is, was reported 60 times. Uh, hearing voices 18 times. Negative experience 7. Exorcism 13. Now, when I went to study for my master's degree at Kent University on the study of mysticism, our senior lecturer, uh, Peter Moore, said to us, um, and this is what led me down this pathway, really, he said, when most people study mystical experiences, they're looking at the positive mystical experience. This is the primary focus of uh, scholars studying these phenomena. He said, but what I want, I want someone to volunteer to look at the negative side of mystical experience. And that's what led me to, down this pathway, really. So um, using negative reports in the archive, we find that, yeah, the vast majority of people are recording positive experiences. And in comparison, very, very few are negative. Now, in comparison, let's look at our data collection methods. The cases that we're looking at are not voluntary cases in response to a question, have you ever had a mystical, spiritual or religious experience? Our database comprises of cases where people are suffering badly and they need help. So they're all negative. So what we do is to enter the baseline data into a database, SPSS or PSPP. And for those of you who are analytical researchers will understand what I'm talking about. Um, then we record the intervention uh, with audio-visual recording devices. And I use belt and braces. When I'm working on a case, I have an audio recorder recording the dialogue. And I'm also recording on Skype the visual, audio-visual interaction with the case. When the case is dealt with, we enter the findings into the database for statistical reporting and descriptive statistics. So we've got before and after data, which can reveal the demographic, demographic data. And certain trends and hypotheses with a, a large enough database can be tested. At the moment, we have 375 recorded cases, and that's increasing at a rate of, on average, one a day. Over the weekend, I had eight new cases come in. Three I dealt with yesterday, two, I, two we did today. So it's a constant flow of people um, asking for help. 
but this is the real crux, this is the real objective of the exercise, to record the data and study it and analyse the dialogue that's taking place. And this is the real meat of, of the exercise. Demographic data, uh, of the 372 cases, uh, sorry, yes, yeah, 372, isn't it? Um, 161 in the UK, 139 in North America, you can see Europe, Australasia, Asia, South America, Africa. So the majority are in UK, North America, uh, with some in Europe. Now, what I find uh, important is the client-patient relationship. To us, the client is the person who's asked for the referral. The patient is the one who needs the help. So what is the relationship between the two? And this tells us that 52% um, were self-referrals. I need help. 32% um, a family member needs help. Nearly 10% uh, a friend, 3.76% uh, a therapist, and that item, uh, a residence property, is, is not to, to help the individual, it's to check a residence that, that is suspected of being haunted or being influenced by a poltergeist, poltergeist activity. So that gives an indication of the, um, the type of referral that we're getting. And in the dialogue that we have, investigation into the dialogue, into the nature of the illness through spirit guides and mediums gives an insight into um, whether what the person is experiencing is self-created or is um, discarnate influence. So I find that particular uh, variable an interesting one. Other demographic variables that we record are the place of residence, that could be with the family or independent. People who are isolated and living alone tend to be more vulnerable than people who live with a family network support. Um, the gender, age band, ethnic origin, the religion they practice. Is there a medical diagnosis? the problem keyword, so that gives us our demographic variables. When we've conducted the procedure, um, the first, and I'm not going to in, into detail about the, the pre procedure itself, that's too long a subject to go into here, but uh, very briefly, the first thing we want to know is this person being affected by a discarnate spirit entity. Is this person sovereign? We use the term sovereignty. Uh, if a person is sovereign, it means that they are the legitimate spirit that occupies that physical body. If they're not sovereign, they're being impacted upon by another spirit. Are they sovereign, yes or no? If no, what are they being affected by? And we just grade them simply, for, for simplicity, for, for uh, data analysis. A minor DFE a gargoyle type, um, low, um, low power, if you like. Um, a severe DFE is what would be termed in religious language um, a devil or a demon, okay? And medium, somewhere in between. Um, so sovereign, uh, those cases that are presented to us, 25% were sovereign, had no spirit influence. Can I just ask a quick question, what's DFE again? Dark force entity. Dark force? Dark force entity. Right, okay. A negative spirit. Um, we use that term, it's a secular term rather than devil or demon. But when we're communicating with the client or the patient, the client will use their own language. And I will often say that uh, if you're using religious language, you might call this a devil or a demon, but we call them a DFE, dark force entity. <laughs> um, so those 
her sovereign, um, 25%, a minor DFE, 47%, severe DFEs, uh, 13%. And they are the most difficult to deal with because they're the most powerful. Now we get to the meat of it, the discourse analysis, the dialogue. We can examine the discourse between the facilitator and the medium. I'm the facilitator, I'm the one asking the questions. The medium that I'm working with is in another place. Uh, I live in Folkestone. The mediums I work with are scattered all over the UK. Um, principally the one I use lives in Wiltshire. So we get on Skype, I connect with him and say, OK, Andrew, we've got a couple of cases to deal with today. And I'll say to him, do you have a spirit guide with you that's going to help? He's the third member of the team. And we work as a team, the three of us. And he'll say, yes, I've got a spirit guide connected with me. I'll record the name of that spirit guide. And I will have a conversation with the guide. I will say to the guide, is this person sovereign? Yes or no? What does he have with him or she have with him? And I'll have a conversation with the guide through the medium. Yeah, you say it in the time because I'm not sure how it works. You are sitting there in the left. The, the, the At my desk with a computer. Maybe Skype? Yeah. And then there is on the other side a medium. A medium. And he has a, guide, a spirit helper. A spirit guide. A spirit guide. Okay. And he, he's a medium. Yes. So they work with the, with the spirit helper and the medium and... Yes. Okay, and that is the three of you, yeah. the th That's the three-person team, yeah. Yourself, the medium and the spirit guide. Without the spirit guide, we can't do anything because you're relying on the knowledge or lack of knowledge of a medium and that's not reliable. Okay. The discourse between the medium and the spirit guides, we can look at. Discourse between the facilitator and the spirit guides, so the, 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 all these different elements of conversation going on. The medium and the guides. And the, now this is really interesting when you discover earthbound spirits, because obviously these are different from dark force entities or demons. These are people who've died and haven't moved on and their spirit remains earthbound. And they are as common as we are believe it or not. We're surrounded by earthbound spirits all the time and, and there are those people who are mediumistic and who have the gift of sight, clairvoyance, who could see them. So when we locate the earthbound spirits then we, we can have a dialogue with them and say, do you, and tell us your story, why are you attached to this person, what's the relationship? It's usually one of um, opportunistic attachment because they've died suddenly uh, they don't believe in an afterlife, they don't know where to go, uh, they're confused uh, and they attach to a living person because they need comfort and support. So there's a sympathetic resonance. Um, children who've died suddenly will attach to a compassionate woman because of the mother, the need for mothering. So we often find uh, women who have a compassionate nature will have a cluster of children gathered around her who've died and need moving on. Uh, I say moving on, we don't move them on, that's the wrong use of language. We, um, we invite uh, relatives who've passed over before to come and collect them and show them the way. So this is what we call uh, releasing the earthbound. Dialogue between the facilitator and the remote patient. And this is the part that excites me most. Because dealing with the DFEs and dealing with the earthbounds is just another day at the office. It's routine, it's regular, it's just everyday business. You know, there's nothing dramatic about it at all. Where we have a difficult case where a person has been suffering from demonic possession for many, many years, they tend to have 
dissociated subpersonalities, which is a split-off part of the self. And this is the vulnerability that attracts the DFE in the first place. If a person has been emotionally or physically abused very early in their life as a child, in order to escape the trauma, and those of you who understand the mechanics of dissociative identity disorder will understand what I'm talking about. This is in the area of clinical psychology. Um, dissociative identity disorder used to be known as multiple personality. Um, and it's created through trauma and the split off part splits off to escape the trauma. And it remains split off, no matter how old the person may become in their mature years. So once we've gone through the protocol of clearing the spiritual dimensions for earthbounds, uh, interdimensional parasites, uh, devils, demons, and there are so many different levels of existence beyond time and space that we can be affected or infected through any of these dimensions. Um, before we move on to the discourse of, with the associated subpersonalities, we have to make sure that the spirit is clean. And this is where healing the wounded spirit comes into its own. We have to make sure that the spiritual energy field, the etheric body of the person, is cleaned and free from any negative interference. The chakras are opened and operating properly, they're being repaired the aura is being repaired um, and when all that work is done then we go into the um, the psychological dimension and the first question I ask is does this person have any self-created thought forms which are different from dissociated subpersonalities Dissocia uh, dissociated subperson is a split off part of the self a self-created thought form is created in addition to the self. And if it's negative, they can be dissolved. If it's positive, then the positive energy of that can be absorbed into the etheric field of the individual. Uh, when it's a dissociated subpersonality, we don't dissolve those because they're a part of the self. And in shamanic language, this is uh, soul loss. So we recover the lost soul part bring it back in, reintegrate it with the core self. So the, first, the person recovers and feels more complete. Now, when you've got a case where a person's been suffering lifelong, 30, 40 years, and we do get these cases, we, we clean the spirit, get rid of all the negative intrusions, then the, uh, the fragmented self needs repairing. And that's where it can take time. So, and this is where the... Um, telepathic hypnosis technique comes in when the therapist, the facilitator is able to engage with the patient beyond time and space in a thera therapeutic relationship using hypnotic techniques. So in a nutshell, that's what we do. And this is the foundation of my understanding where I gained my doctorate at, at Bangor um, my research focused on the um, scientific methods used by 19th century researchers William James and Pierre Janet and W.H. Uh, Myers. So that gave me an understanding of, of a scientific framework where these phenomena can be acknowledged as scientific and not just the results of creative imagination or superstition. It does have a scientific framework, uh, and my book explains that. What I'm looking for now are um, institutions that can uh, have a look at this research method and the data that I've produced. Uh, I call it first test because it's just a, a pilot study, and it's very primitive and very simple. Um, and I, fortunately, I've been invited uh, by Edward and Mary Kelly to go and visit them in um, the University of Virginia at the um, Department of Perceptual Studies where they are engaged in studying these dialogues with mediums and so on. So um, hopefully um, 
we'll get a chance for some collaboration there. I've just got to fix, the, fix a date when I go and visit them. But look, the invitation is there. Um, and I'm happy to say that all this research began here in Lampeter. Any questions? <laughs> Yes. Do you have any questions? One question. This lady. You started with the six or seven uh, questions yeah. you, you asked yourself before yeah. you started the... Yeah. And the first was, one of the first, um, how do you um, see the difference between somebody who is possessed mm -hmm. and somebody who has hallucination or... Uh, psychosis. Yeah, there's a very, very simple answer to that question. We ask the spirits, is this person sovereign? Are they hearing? Is this a main, it's, it's a shortened version of asking a difficult question. Is this person sovereign? Yes or no? This person is sovereign. They are the sole spiritual occupier of this physical form. So if there's no external spirit impacting on them, then what they're hearing is probably self-generated. And they need, um, they may be experiencing delusions. But as I say, and, and as Fa when Fabian introduced the, um, this panel, the focus is on studying the dialogue, studying the conversations that take place during the um, intervention session. And uh, those that are of particular interest to me, uh, with approval uh, and help uh, and a contribution, because it takes time, it costs money to do it. If, uh, if the, the client family agree, we will have the sessions transcribed word for word for study and analysis. Um, and we have several cases like that that we've been working on. Uh, and several sessions that have been transcribed, sufficient enough now to provide the backbone of a book on the subject. It just needs putting together and putting into theoretical framework. But all the evidence is there to be analysed and studied. It's fascinating to read. Yeah, I'm interested in the telepathy part. Mm -hmm. Is the telepathy initiated by the spirit guide or by yourself? Good question. Or the okay, good question. When I feel that there's uh, an, an advantage to be gained from using this method, I will say to the medium, right, I don't want you to interact with the spirit guide now. The spirit guide takes a back seat. They're, they, they observe, they keep protection in place to protect from DFEs because we do come under attack from dark forces that try and prevent us doing the work. So the spirit guide is there in protection and I'll say to the medium, I want you to connect now with the patient, with the subject. Now these people have a very, very regular tendency to, be, to find it easy to engage in dialogue with spirit entities. It's part of the illness that they have. Uh, that it's diagnosed as delusional or um, auditory hallucinations. They're talking to spirits all the time. So, and they find it easier to do than to talk to human beings. So uh, we use that to our, I use it to, uh, to my advantage. And I'll say to the medium, I want you to approach this person and um, make your presence known to them very gently. Uh, and they will come up behind them and perhaps gently tap them on the shoulder or whisper something. And I'll say to the uh, medium, um, is this person aware of your presence? And they are now. And what's their response? Oh, surprised. What do they say? Where do you come from? Who are you? It's two people talking. So I'll say to the medium, uh, tell the person who you, why you're here, you're a friend of the family, and name a member of the family, and you're here to help, is there anything I can do for you? So friendship and a, a trust, a rapport is established. Without that you can do nothing. And this is a simple principle, this is a tenet of um, effective therapeutic 
relationship anyway. If the patient doesn't trust the therapist, you're going nowhere. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we do is establish that trust. And we have cases where the patient will say, yeah, I've heard all that before. I'm being told by all these voices they're my friend, but then they you know, tell me to kill myself and all this business. So then the media will say, well, I'm a friend of your Auntie Angie. And she's, oh, really? Yeah. And so you give family information that they relate to. So you build that trust. And the medium says, we're here to help. Um, I've got a friend here with me that wants to talk to you. Uh, uh, we just want to know what you want. I just want to be left alone. This person may be locked in their bedroom, on the computer, watching pornography or talking to spirits, all kinds of unhealthy behaviour. Just leave me alone, go away. And this is the problem the family are presented with. So how do you reach a person like that? You use this method. You go through the back door. So uh, I establish um, a dialogue with the patient and I enter into a therapeutic relationship with him or her using um, methods that are known to me to work as hypnotherapeutic suggestions. Uh, for example, a, a, rec a very recent case, a woman who'd been diagnosed with psychosis at the age of 19. She's now in her 60s. She's been prosecuted for poisoning her entire family and trying to kill them. She's been violent, abusive, dangerous, locked up several times. All her life she's suffered from these afflictions. Um, we cleared all the negative uh, stuff away from her and there was an immediate transformation. And the first thing that a relative noticed was that the colour of her eyes changed from black to brown which was her natural colour. When a person's possessed by a demonic entity, their eyes go black. And that's the first sign that goes along with the destructive behaviour. So, and, and one of the first signs that a person is free from negative entities is that their eye colour returns to normal. And their behaviour changes. Um, but the damage is done to the psych psychological self. They have to learn to uh, recover their sense of self, their, their own identity. If there are dissociated parts, they need to be negotiated with and reintegrated. And if there's resistance, that's a hard job. So you have to use this method to negotiate with the dissociated parts. But you don't physiologically speak to the person. You speak through the telepathically through the medium. Once, once, the once the connection is established, the medium steps aside then, and I'm then speaking to the patient. You're speaking to the patient or the possessing deity or influencing... The, the possessing deities are gone by now. You can't do anything all the time you've got dark force entities in the way, because they will interfere with the work. The spirit needs to be cleaned first, and clear, and pure. Then you approach the fragmented personality. So you, you've done the spiritual work, now you're doing the psychological work. And is the patient aware that you're doing this? No, not consciously aware, no. And they, are they consciously aware when the healing process is complete? They, they become consciously aware. Let me give you an example. A recent case, a case of a woman in Germany, brought to our attention by a daughter. And she said her mother uh, had been diagnosed with psychosis for 30 years. She'd been diagnosed when she was in her 40s. She's now, in her, she's now 71 years old. Uh, living in squalor, alcoholic, uh, um, completely unmanageable, um, desperate. The family tried everything, psychiatrists and healers, nothing worked. Um, and they asked us to intervene. So we did the first clearance, clear, cleared away all the, the dark negative stuff. And um, the daughter telephoned the mother and said, Mum, how are you? And the mother said, uh, I feel fine. It's great. Uh, the only trouble is I can't watch the television because voices keep coming out of the television. So we went back in and had another look and we surveyed the the dwelling, her apartment where she was living, and we found an interdimensional portal that was using the television to deliver messages to her. 
So we asked the spirit guides to come in. They closed that portal and sealed it. So her dwelling was secure. And the following day, the mother invited her daughter and her son around to visit, which she never did, but she invited them round. So they went to see her, full of apprehension about how she was. And she'd stopped drinking, she'd cleaned the apartment, she'd had a bath, she'd dyed her hair, she cooked dinner and baked them a cake and her eyes had turned from black to brown in two sessions. And for me that is efficacy, that it works. Yes? Thank you. It was, it was a very brilliant presentation and I'm, I'm not really from this field so it was good to hear you uh, speak, especially the fact that you took a very personal, uh, you know, the presentation was not like talking about them and theirs but you took a very personal way of, um, you know, with your experiences, examples and things like that. Um, my, my question to you is, the sessions seem to be very serious and intense and I'm assuming that it has an impact on the facilitators themselves. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to hear something <laughs> about that. <laughs> In the early days, uh, working as a traditional hypnotherapist, and I was working with a doctor, a, a general practitioner who would refer his patients to me with chronic illness. Um, and when I first encountered what I now describe as the such challenging cases, they are very, very dangerous in terms that you're describing. They can be physically threatening, they can be psychologically damaging because some of these dark force entities, uh, they are interdimensional species, they are highly intelligent, far more intelligent than we are, and they can run rings around us. With, with their intellect. Uh, they can de deceive us, lie, and they can, they can implant messages. And this is the focus of my book. The, the central core, central pillar of my book is the principle of telepathic hypnosis, which was scientifically validated in the 19th century and is now ignored by medical science, as is all um, the use of hypnosis in surgery is ignored by medical science now. But the work that I do shows how effective it is. So when a hypnotherapist is presented with a patient who has an entity that knows how to cause psychological harm to a therapist, you get it. And you've got to take a sharp step backwards and you feel the danger, you feel the threat. And when that was happening to me, I said to the doctor, I said, I've got to take time out. I, I need to learn how to deal with this. So I had to go away and learn these principles and, and learn all about it. And that is a story in itself. Yeah, dangerous. But now I'm fully protected. I have no fear. Fear is the key, actually. If you're afraid, it can be used against you. So to do this work, you have to be totally fearless. Can I time for one or two more questions? Another three, four minutes. Yeah. Um, in earlier on, you described uh, mm -hmm. negative influences. You use religious language of devils and demons. Mm. Uh, is there any <coughs> evidence that the use of such uh, words, such descriptions, was more prevalent time past than it is today? Uh, as a practitioner, and, and I've not researched this, uh, but my guess is that it was more prevalent in times past. Um, people, uh, uh, when we lived in a, a society that was more religiously minded, then the, uh, the terminology devils and demons and angels was, was more keeping with everyday language, but because we've become less religious, more secular. Um, uh, neutral language is more common. And I will often say to a spirit guide when we encounter a grade three, um, and if I've got the time, which uh, these days I don't often have, but if I've got the time to investigate further, I'll say to the spirit guide, hmm, interesting, I'm, I'm interested to know 
the origin and the nature of this species uh, and its origin. And we have uh, the answers come back. Well, this was first recognised and documented in the hieroglyphs of ancient Egypt. And this was presented and worshipped as one of the ancient gods. Uh, but it's uh, an incident dimensional species that used the ignorance of people at that time to present themselves as a god and they were worshipped much to their detriment. And they still exist and they still influence people. And they've got names. <laughs> yeah, mine's an observation, really. I, I relate to what you say. I've, I've sort of not, I don't want to use the word dabble, but I've, people I've, I've known have been more involved in, in that, this type of area than I have. Um, I suppose I, my sort of idea of these is slightly different. Um, there's a physical reality for me, and there's a, there's a kind of psychological or spiritual reality depending upon one's point of view. But somewhere between, there's a psychoid reality, which is somewhere between. Uh, and these entities, if you want to call them, because I think they will be experienced differently by different people, seem to inhabit that sort of dimension. Um, but I would sort of step back from that and say that for some people, their reality is purely mundane. They have no sort of inkling of, um, of these other dimensions. Some people experience, would experience what you describe as a metaphor rather than a reality. And, and another group of people would experience the metaphysical dimension that you've described. So I kind of think um, perhaps for these ideas to be more accessible to, because I do think they have validity, real validity and are helpful in, in sort of sorting out the situations you describe. Perhaps sort of some other conceptual frameworks need to sort of come into play because I can see some people really standing off um, these sorts of art, these, these ideas, finding them very difficult to um, kind of uh, um, grasp, I yeah, suppose. Yeah, yeah, well that is the difficulty in, uh, in sharing this information with people who have different perceptual frameworks, uh, the medical profession in particular. Um, when a person presents to a doctor who's hearing voices, and in my notes I was going to go into greater detail, there's no real need for it because we all understand that when a person's hearing voices they're very reluctant to go and see a doctor because they're, they're being labelled as mentally ill or they're afraid of being called crazy by their relatives so they very much keep it to themselves. So the, the way these phenomena are perceived by people around us in the family, in, the, in our social circles and in the institutions uh, are serious inhibitory factors to understanding these principles. Um, from, speaking for myself, um, I choose to use um, what I can identify with William James's philosophy of pragmatism. Keep it simple and does it work? Whatever language you use, keep it simple, does it work? And for me, it, and for my patients, it does. Okay. Thank you for listening. Yeah. I think that was uh, quite brilliant. It's a very, very hard act to follow. <laughs>
So there, witnessed a couple of sessions, we've seen how long it takes in comparison with um, traditional medical methods and therapies. We're treating people who've been suffering their entire lives from abuse and neglect and all kinds of emotional and physical trauma. Um, and what we're trying to do is to heal the sick in the best, most efficient way possible. And this is the method we're using.